everybody's talking about Emma, um, but in our case, this has obviously been for some time Emma Talentire, um, who uh, graduated uh, in uh, 2002 from uh, University of Nottingham and did uh, training in Australia and in Nottingham and in Cardiff and uh, completed an MRC uh, research fellowship and a PhD in the context thereof uh, at the Peter Mansfield um, Center for MR, uh, uh, MRI. Um, now she's uh, presenting about a slightly different topic today, which is the vaccine response to DMTs. She's uh, leading jointly and no doubt uh, um, also sort of, uh, on her own um, uh, this uh, research. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to what you have to say, which will be based on a review and uh, on her own data. Uh, Emma, please come forward. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks very much. Jeff and Bill. So thanks very much to the organisers for inviting me and to the sponsors of the meeting. And I'm delighted to be opening this morning talking about vaccines and boosting. Um, so first of all, I do have some disclosures. Importantly, I have received honorarium um, from companies, including those who manufacture some of the products I mentioned today. Um, it's important to say that I'm a neurologist. I'm not an immunologist, but I'm going to try and tell you something about vaccine immunology. Uh, so I might be... Um, venturing into uh, slightly dangerous territory uh, as a neurologist. But, um, and although I'll be talking about boosts, I'm quite partial to this sort of boost. Uh, it'll be a different type. I'm going to try not to let that sway um, my stance on vaccines and boosting. So this talk really, I hope to cover, so, so I suppose the title of whether we should boost um, the vaccine response in people who are on MSDMTs is largely driven by lots of the controversy around COVID and vaccination for COVID-19. And actually, as you're probably aware, in the UK, the JCVI have made some decisions, certainly around the, um, who's going to receive a third vaccine of their primary course for COVID. So I think in a way that topic is slightly less controversial now. But what I hope to take the opportunity to do um, under that heading is to just think about why we vaccinate in general, actually, because there were many, many vaccinations around before we embarked on COVID vaccinations. And I think it's really important that we understand a little bit about vaccine biology, just so that we can put that together with the DMT biology and understand how those things interact. And I think, as always, it's really important to look at what we know, but of course, what we don't know. And I think there are some really important important unanswered questions that I want to touch upon. So I think, I think it's a great place to start actually just trying to think about how vaccines have changed the health of the world. Um, and you know, when you reflect on that, the smallpox vaccination, such an important example and so interesting in terms of the history. So I hadn't realized actually how long smallpox had been around before the vaccination. So even human remains from as early as the third century BCE, there's some suggestion that there was evidence of a disease like smallpox. There's recording of um, very sort of ancient worshiping of particular gods um, in China in the Indian subcontinent um, as a means to try and to prevent people from getting a disease like smallpox. And then there's some documentation now about how the spread with the Crusades and then with the opening of trade across the Atlantic, how the spread of the disease moved around the globe um, and became, by the 16th, 17th century, such an important disease in terms of mortality. So, um, as you're probably aware, it caused an illness which had mainly skin manifestations and fever, but it was hugely um, dangerous disease. So about a third of people died overall, but the infant mortality was really high, uh, maybe even as high as 80%. So it was a big contributor to sort of child mortality at the time. Um, and then there was this interesting practice called variolation that sort of preceded vaccination as we know it now. And the idea of variolation was that they would take um, st uh, scabs, essentially, from someone that had smallpox and they would break that down and they would um, you know, give it to somebody, usually by scratching their skin surface and rubbing it on the skin. And that would induce a disease that had a fairly high mortality rate itself, but lower than the mortality of smallpox if you, if you got it um, sort of de novo. So that was already going on and there was... Um, uh, Lady Montagu was a kind of important proponent of this and in the 17th century um, people you know in the higher circles of society were sort of paying physicians to do undertake this procedure for their children because they were aware of the benefit um, to their health 
And that preceded Edward Jenner, who you will have heard of, I'm sure, who um, started out as an apprentice to a country surgeon, and he'd already witnessed how dairy maids who were milking the cows, who had um, cowpox, seemed to be immune from smallpox. And he took that knowledge, and when he became a physician in London, he then used that to sort of start the first trials of taking infected matter um, from the hand of a dairy, cow, uh, a dairy maid who'd been milking cows and had um, cowpox and injected that into some poor eight-year-old boy um, who then had a febrile illness um, that was for a few days and, and you know, recovered and then re-challenged him and found that he was then immune to um, smallpox. And that was the sort of birth of vaccination as we know it. And it's interesting to know that actually Edward Jenner submitted that work to the Royal Society and it was rejected. So it's quite reassuring to all of us who've had lots of our work rejected from various um, eminent uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, publications to know that that was initially rejected. And it took him actually years to get the notoriety that he deserved for um, this finding. And of course, it led to a huge... Um, uh, public health intervention that was uh, sort of global vaccination. But, you know, that timeline to eradicate smallpox was surprisingly long, given that, uh, that he um, discovered the vaccine, or pr produced the vaccine um, back in the 18th century. So since then, I think this is quite a nice um, schematic, just illustrating the huge advances in vaccinology and immunology um, that have happened since then. And of course, um, from the first smallpox vaccine, there was the ability to attenuate pathogens, there was the ability to extract toxins um, from things like diphtheria that could be then given to generate an antitoxin, um, immune response and so on. And of course now um, we can add to that the most recent um, vaccine types, which are these viral vectors that we're aware of in the Chadox adenoviral vector um, COVID vaccine um, and um, the nucleic, uh, the mRNA vaccines that have been used most recently. So um, since about the 1960s, there has been a routine immunisation schedule in the UK, and I think it is important for us to be aware of that, um, partly because some of the, if we were ourselves brought up in the UK or if our children were, you know, even since then there have been additions to this vaccine schedule, so it's important to sort of keep updated about that so that the individuals we see coming through, even though many of them are going to be adults, and um, we're aware of which vaccinations they should have had. Um, and as you can see in childhood, which is shown on the left here, um, you know, you'll be well aware of the sort of um, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, um, polio, Hib, so Haemophilus influenza, Hep B, there's the various meningitis ones, um, and the um, addition of um, pneumococcus, uh, MMR, and, and then HPV, and that was introduced for girls in 2018, and then you might be aware that girls and boys received that vaccine now um, for the last few years, and likewise, and the extended sort of spectrum of meningitis vaccines and so on. Um, so that's important to be aware of. And also in the adult population, there are, again, some routine immunizations that are offered to the whole adult population, which are from the age of 65, the pneumococcal vaccine, obviously the annual influenza, and then from the age of 70, a shingles vaccine. But there are also recommendations um, for um, TB and high incidence or high risk groups um, and then there are some um, recommendations around people who are immunosuppressed um, uh, or have primary immunodeficiency. Um, so in terms of the schedule of vaccinations, why do we do that? Well, it would seem obvious, but I think these um, uh, diagrams are just incredibly striking, aren't they? Um, in terms of the um, uh, incidence of disease compared with the introduction of vaccination. Uh, and that's clearly why we vaccinate. But just to try and put that in context, um, the WHO estimate that um, infant or child mortality has been reduced um, hugely since the introduction of um, routine vaccine schedules. But of course, we have to remember there are still significant challenges with vaccinology. So this um, paper, which I've cited here, is a really nice review um, just from this year of how far we've come, but also what challenges remain. And three of the challenges they cite, which I think are interesting, is, of course, there are pathogens that have been very difficult to vaccinate against, so HIV being a great example. Um, the global access to vaccines, you'll be aware, was COVID, you know, lots of sort of ethics around, you know, in the developed versus the developing world, how easy it is to get hold of vaccines. But actually, the third thing that they highlight in this, um, which is very relevant to this talk, is, is how we deal with people who have a weakened immune system, whether it's the elderly population or whether it's people that have primary or secondary um, immune um, compromise. Um, continues to be a huge challenge, so I think that's very relevant to this talk. So there was a nice review in Practical Neurology um, 
which I've uh, sort of adapted slightly here just to remind you that actually all adults with MS, irrespective of DMT, there are some considerations we could make in terms of a brief intervention when we meet them in the clinic and just making sure that they're up to date with all of the adult vaccinations they should have had. And some of those are more relevant to adult disease than others. So some things, um, you know, are, are more relevant to sort of childhood illness. But, um, but there are some things. So HPV, we know that there's an ongoing discussion about your risk of cancer if you're on any disease-modifying therapy. Um, so important to make sure that people who are eligible have received it. Um, HPV immunizes for the... Um, for the types of, uh, for the serotypes that are most um, sort of relevant to cervical cancer, but also anogenital um, cancers and actually oropharyngeal cancers as well are relevant with this virus. Um, so if people are under the age of 25, there is a sort of catch up, um, you know, offer of vaccination. But actually, even people in older age groups, if you think that they're going to be immune suppressed, um, it's worth considering. It's a bit uncertain about once people are sexually active and if they become colonised with these vaccines, how, how much benefit they derive. But still, it's a, a discussion worth having. Um, influenza, making sure people are informed about that, and particularly uh, um, making sure that their household members and carers also aware um, of the importance of having it. And apart from people aged over 65, there's a suggestion in the Green Book that people who have immunosuppression should be offered um, pneumococcal vaccine, should be considered for VZV vaccines, particularly if they don't have evidence of um, immunity to VZV from childhood chickenpox. Um, and just making sure that there were some people who missed their MMR. Um, and you know, in this, in this um, uh, uh, set of guidance, um, there's a suggestion that we should be doing, for instance, anti-measles, antibodies in people who are thought to have perhaps missed their MMR. So there are lots of considerations we can give in the clinic. Um, now, if we give a vaccination to someone who has an intact immune system, there's every reason to just presume that that vaccine will work. But if we're dealing with people that have a weakened immune system for any reason, including taking DMTs, then how do we know whether we can count the vaccine as having been a success? Well, I suppose we need to have some understanding, as I say, of vaccine biology. Um, and I think it's important just to understand the concept that giving a vaccine here, the idea is that we are, um, the innate immune system will respond quickly and there'll be this delay in the adaptive immune system um, kicking in. And by giving a vaccination, we hope that at the time of the second exposure, um, the adaptive immune system will ramp up much more quickly and, and uh, more effectively than it would have done if, if they hadn't had a prior exposure um, to the antigen. Um, and in terms of um, the immune response. I'm sure you'll be aware, um, uh, and many people in this room will have a much more detailed understanding of this than, than I do, but I think it's important just at a basic level to be aware that um, at the time that the vaccination is given and the antigen is presented, and that there will be a cellular response and there will be a humoral, so B cell antigen, uh, antibody producing uh, response. And actually, um, that's detailed quite nicely in this paper for the mRNA and the adenoviral uh, vector COVID vaccination. So of course the mechanism of getting the antigen presented is different, but the, the vaccine biology from that point on um, is, is fairly similar. Um, so having a measurable marker of an immune response to a vaccine is really important because, um, well, we want to be able to tell whether someone has been protected. And it's generally, um, you can measure IgG, is the most common sort of immune correlate that people would look for of protection. But as I'm sure you've heard around COVID, you know, there is also this measurement of this sort of cellular response. Um, and that's generally done, I mean, in the COVID trials, it was done by collecting blood from people at regular intervals and looking at their response. But historically for other vaccines, it's been done in a much more um, zero epidemiological approach where you would just look at the um, particularly IgG levels in a, in a population and then look at their risk of disease and try and work out from that what the level of IgG you need um, for something like pneumococcus to be protected from getting the clinical disease, from getting severe disease and, and from dying um, from the disease. And that's obviously really important because it's difficult to do a trial where you give the vaccine and wait for the disease to happen. Um, it's much easier to give a, a, do a trial where you give the vaccine and you look at how many people get a protective response. But it's important to say that we don't really know what the immune correlate of protection for COVID is yet, and that's going to be really important information. Um, it's important to know the immune correlate of uh, any vaccine and protection against the disease because it means that we can then accelerate the way that we study the vaccine, we can um, get access to other populations, particularly populations that wouldn't have been involved in the original clinical trials, 
Um, and of course, in the context of MS, it's important that we might be able to advise the individual and say, well, look, you appear to have a high risk of you know, pneumococcus or COVID or whatever it is. And therefore, these are the steps you might take to protect yourself against infection. Um, so um, in terms of the relevance of DMT, then, of course, we know a bit about vaccine biology and we know a bit about um, DMT biology. Um, and you can already understand that the way in which disease-modifying therapies for MS work is likely to interact with vaccines. But I think it's also important just to remember that it really depends on a few things, which might include when the disease-modifying therapy is given versus the vaccination. So, for instance, if you're giving a DMT and then someone has their first exposure to a novel antigen, be it disease or vaccine, um, what will be their response versus someone who's already experienced a vaccine and is then started on a DMT, or perhaps already experienced a vaccine and a booster, and so on. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, and actually, even before COVID, there were some studies, although it's fair to say that the literature is fairly scarce, around vaccine response in people on MS-DMT. So I've tried to sort of summarise what we knew here, and I haven't included all the references, but I can provide those if people are interested. But essentially, um, as I'll go on to show in a minute, there was a uh, um, signal that um, there was an attenuated response to both a novel or a recall, meaning a booster to something that someone had experienced prior to starting on ocrelizumab. Um, both of those responses appeared to be attenuated, and there was some signal for that um, also in fingolimod. There seemed to be the suggestion that for drugs like alemtuzumab and cladribine, if you gave a, a novel or a recall antigen um, sufficiently far from the most recent infusion or most recent oral course of cladribine um, that you would get an adequate response but as I say the literature was fairly scarce and you can see there are quite a lot of areas particularly in the newer drugs um, where this is uh, not known. So this is just some data which you may well be familiar with um, from the Veloci study um, uh, where there was a novel antigen which is this uh, keyhole limpet hemocyanin which is a sort of macro molecule which is often used to um, stimulate the immune system in the context of presenting another antigen. And you can see that in healthy controls here, there's a really, these were the three doses that were given of the KLH. And you can see that there's a, um, a pretty impressive IgG IgM response. It is very immunogenic. Um, and you can see that that response was um, considerably attenuated in people that had received um, a single dose of ocrelizumab. Um, the recall effect, it seems to be, so you can appreciate that people already had some response to tetanus, as you'd expect, because they all would have had their childhood vaccinations, hopefully. Um, but you can see that in the healthy controls, there was a, a sort of higher magnitude of response to a booster jab. Um, some response within the ocrelizumab group, but, but attenuated. But a suggestion that there was more of a problem with the novel than the recall antigen. So it probably wasn't too much of a surprise um, when we saw this really nice data um, coming from uh, Dr. Acheron and colleagues um, from Israel early in the COVID pandemic, where they were the first ones to show um, that the um, immunoglobulin um, anti-SARS-CoV um, response was lower in the people who were taking ocrelizumab and fingolimod versus those who were on other DMTs uh, untreated or healthy controls. Um, and that's since been shown um, by some groups um, which are um, in preprint here and published here, where there seems to be this consistent signal that um, these drugs seem to have an attenuated response to the COVID vaccine versus people who are not on treatment. Um, and this was our work, which is uh, in preprint form, um, which shows that after the first vaccine and after the second vaccine um, against COVID-19. So, um, in terms of what affects that response, I've talked already about novel versus memory. There is an effect of age, which is fairly consistent in that um, as people get older, their vaccine response is generally uh, less, um, uh, less good. Um, vaccine type, you know, the, the finding that the mRNA vaccine seems to be slightly higher efficacy in the general population seems to stand up um, in those who are um, immunocompromised. Um, in some of the papers, including ours, there was this effect of accumulation um, of treatment duration. So particularly in the anti-CD20s, the longer you'd been having treatment, um, the less good your vaccine response. But it's fair to say that hasn't been um, reproduced in all of the studies. But there does seem to be um, a suggestion that the time since your last treatment is relevant. Now, I'm sure if you're a clinician, you were quite aware that patients and um, other clinicians were saying, well, um, should we be vaccinating people at a certain sweet spot in between there, for instance, ocrelizumab infusions, perhaps after three months or four months or something. Now, 
Although there's a suggestion that the longer you leave it since their most recent anti-CD20 infusion, the more likely they are to get um, a, a better response. Um, you can see um, in this nice data from Maria Piersamani and colleagues, which is also in preprint form, um, that actually to get a response, and this is just looking at IgG, but to get a response that is similar to the healthy population up here, actually you would have to wait um, quite a long time, sort of at least uh, sort of nine to 12 months before the first people generated that response. Um, so it's, I think the jury's still out about within the six month window, whether there's much to be gained by timing it um, differently. Um, so why is all of this relevant? Well, of course, if we're in the clinic room with an individual with MS who's on a DMT, we might have some um, thought about whether it would be in their best interest to pause or delay their treatment to try and enable them to get a better vaccine response. There's discussion about the timing of vaccination, which I've mentioned, the type of vaccination. And then in people where, despite our best efforts, we can still recognise that their immune correlate shows that they probably are less well protected against a pathogen. Well, as I say, it does enable us to give them some infection control advice, at least. And we've certainly, in the study we've been doing with Ruth Jobson and others, where we've been testing people's immunoglobulin response to COVID, and in some cases, their T-cell response, if we know that they are sort of double negative and they haven't generated a measurable response to COVID, then we've been able to at least give them some quite robust advice about what to do to try and protect themselves. Um, so coming back to the question before I finish about to boost or not to boost, um, the JCVI is advice I'm going to tell you about, but just to think about the science, I suppose, well, one of the things we were interested by was that you're probably aware that after the first vaccine in people who are untreated uh, as the general population, um, they get quite a good response to the vaccine already measured by um, immunoglobulin. Um, but actually, it was interesting to see, I mean, the numbers we had of people on cladribine was low, but actually it was interesting to see that for some DMTs, the second vaccine was very important to get that immune response. And, um, you know, you, you might hypothesise then that individuals who still didn't mount a response after the second vaccine, perhaps a third would help. Um, as I've showed you from the Veloci study, it's uncertain because these sort of inflections that you can see here in the um, untreated um, population, you know, you just don't really see here despite three um, doses of this very immunogenic um, vaccine. So I think it's still a question over whether there will be some individuals that no matter how many times you challenge them with the antigen, they still won't mount a response. Um, but thinking again about why we vaccinate, of course, we vaccinate generally to protect someone from disease, but actually Stephen Jollies, who's an immunologist that, um, that we work very closely with in Cardiff, both clinically and in research, um, and I um, published um, some time ago on um, the use of rituximab in neuromyelitis optica and um, sort of, you know, forced people to revisit this idea that actually if you study immunoglobulin, it does tend to go down over long periods of time when people are receiving anti-CD20. But actually the disease-specific immunoglobulins can be really informative. And one of the things that Stephen Jollies regularly does with people that he looks after with primary immune deficiencies, but also with the people that we send him who have developed a secondary antibody deficiency as he challenges them. Because apart from measuring their immune system in this way, he likes to measure in a more dynamic way when he vaccinates them, whether they mount a response. So actually it is telling us something about the function of that person's immune system. So JCVI then have given some advice about the third vaccine course and who will be eligible for that. And although they admit the scarce data, there is some data which I just wanted to share finally with you because I think it's really interesting and it's, it's very recent. So these three studies that I'll show you now are all from a population of people who were solid organ transplant recipients. So they have been taking drugs that are different from MSDMTs, but in many ways analogous. Um, and um, this was a very impressive piece of work where there was um, 120 people who were randomized to, they'd all received two doses of an mRNA um, COVID vaccine and they were randomized to either receiving a third dose um, after a, a period of, of two months or um, receiving uh, a placebo. And what you can appreciate in this population who median age was 66 is that um, the chance of having an anti-receptor binding domain um, antibody um, at four months um, was you know, considerably higher, three times higher in the um, group of people that had a third dose versus those who had placebo. Um, I, I've just told you that there isn't a good immune correlative protection for COVID. And then I'm saying that they had protective anti-RBD. What they did here was they looked at primate models and they looked at where you can challenge a primate um, to, um, who's been vaccinated with the virus. And you can see which, which primates develop the disease or not. So they, they extrapolated from that. But, um, so I think that's quite encouraging to suggest that in the majority of people, um, a third dose, um, even though they were immunosuppressed, um, did 
cause some people to seroconvert, and I think that's been supported by the other two studies that I'll now show you, which were observational studies, but nevertheless, they had a similar approach um, where they looked at, so here you're looking at um, immunoglobulin against the COVID um, antigen um, before and after the third dose, and I think you can appreciate this increase, which is shown here as a, a titer. This is the proportion of people that were seropositive. Um, and again, this is a smaller study, but similar idea. And those who were low positive pre-third dose all converted to being high positive. A proportion of the people who were negative pre-third dose did convert. But as I say, there were a proportion of people who, um, you know, perhaps irrespective of how many times we boost them, they may never zero convert. It's, it's uncertain. So despite the scarce data, we have to think about do no harm. Um, and... Um, I'd encourage you to have a look at this um, nice paper that's recently been published about the difficulty with associating um, adverse events to a vaccine um, to try and understand whether they are um, the, the causation, essentially, of that, which is really, really difficult. But I think in, in the context of that, um, as was highlighted uh, here, the evidence seems to be against any causal link in vaccines causing either the onset of MS or relapses in MS, um, so we think that we're doing no harm. And it's on that basis that JCVI have said that um, the provision of a third primary dose to people who are immunosuppressed is going to draw on the assumption that we're unlikely to confer significant harm, but they may offer benefit. So just to kind of update you on the UK stance, we are talking about a third vaccine in the primary course, and that's going to be offered to people who either have a, a primary or acquired immune deficiency, so perhaps HIV or primary immune deficiency, or people who were immunosuppressed at the time of their first vaccine. And these are the categories JCVI have postulated, and this is just from the MS Society and their suggestion of how that might be interpreted in an MS cohort. So perhaps people who've received these agents within the prior six months, perhaps uh, three months, and perhaps people who've had anti-CD20 um, exposure in the, in the past three to six months. Um, but actually, there's a bit of semantics now because it's important to understand that what we're talking about at the moment and what I've just showed you is deemed to be the third dose of the primary course. So the idea is they will be able to have a third dose if they're at least eight weeks after their um, second dose. And a separate booster um, campaign will start um, in the winter um, at, at stage and for people that has not yet been confirmed. But that will be giving another dose of the COVID vaccine at least six months after the first course. So just to understand the semantics. So my last slide is just talking about unanswered questions. Um, so heterologous versus homologous vaccines. So the idea is, do you give AstraZeneca? And if you've had AstraZeneca, you then give mRNA and vice versa. So if you happen to receive the Pfizer vaccine the first time, you should be given AstraZeneca a second time so that you've got that heterologous approach. There was some suggestion from preclinical animal work that that was um, beneficial. But actually, this nice study um, that's just been published suggested that actually um, the Chadox, Chadox, so the double sort of Oxford vaccine, um, was less um, efficacious than any combination that included mRNA. So it didn't seem to support this heterologous. So at the moment, um, uh, I think um, the JCVI is suggesting that an mRNA um, vaccine for people who are having their third dose. Um, I've mentioned that we don't know what the immune correlates of protection for COVID are. And we're not sure which of the individuals that will benefit from a third dose, whether we should pause or discontinue um, DMTs. And actually, even before COVID, I don't know whether you've ever come across this, but we sometimes had a situation where someone um, was known to be, have evidence of immunity to varicella, and um, we gave them perhaps alimtuzumab or cladribine or whatever. And then somewhere along the line, someone would retest them for varicella and find out that they were now serum negative. And there was this question about, should we be vaccinating them, revaccinating them, and so on? So I think there are uncertainties about what to do when people become serum negative and, and how we should deal with that. So in conclusion, we've uh, heard that um, vaccines have been a life-saving uh, public health intervention. It's important for us to just be aware of the schedule of vaccination that all of the adults coming through our clinic should have had, how DMTs will interfere with vaccine biology, um, and the fact that there are some um, various factors that um, affect that, including DMT. Um, and overall, a good understanding of the sort of functional um, immunity that we have will allow us ultimately to personalise risk, including uh, giving booster vaccinations. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much.